I'm Travis Brown, founder and CEO of Mojo Up Marketing and Media. And this is my podcast, where I talk to the most successful black and brown business executives who've broken through the barriers of today's business culture. Welcome to Mojo Up Live, diverse and talented podcast. I'm your host, Travis Brown, and today I have Rapal Tanawana. She is a president, a business leader, community servant, and just an amazing person who's super connected to like everybody and who is anybody in this city. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What a lovely moment to just have a sit down and conversation with you. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about, uh, I want to start out the gate because you are like a connector that knows like, I feel like like everybody. So uh, where does that come from with the desire to just be so networked and just know everybody? I think that is really something that I learned from my dad. Uh, I, he's my role model. Uh, he's no more with us, but he's still with me every single day. Uh, he had a grocery store, a corner store that you would call it, you know, in U.S. But then his small grocery store, everybody would stop by. He would know everyone. And besides just selling uh, the supplies that people needed for their home, he was the one who was always helping out everyone every single day. And growing up, seeing that a, a successful entrepreneur who had to also work very hard to be who he was, but then also serving the community every day and probably the networking, customer service and how people connect with people. I think those skills I learned from my dad. Yeah. And today I want to talk about, you know, you being the president of your company, um, you know, you serve on several boards and just the overall philanthropic, you know, mindset um, in the community. But before I do that, take me back to, all right, so, so where are you born? Where do you go to school? What's that, what's that journey of, of the origin look like? So I'm uh, born in Mumbai, India, okay. uh, and uh, in a family of five sisters. Uh, we were in a very small, um, fa small and a very limited resources we had, but a lot of love in the family. And I think that is where many values I just mentioned that comes from. Uh, that's my family. Uh, grew up in a very small 350 square foot uh, home. Which is, we really had just a one common room and one kitchen. And in my family, none of the women went to the college or didn't work outside the house. So I'm the first generation women who went to the college to get a professional degree. So I'm a biomedical engineer from Mumbai. And uh, I was around people who were not really there to actually give me that encouragement and to give me the support that I needed to even go to the college. But my family truly believed in me uh, I was just reading some books and everything, and I said, you know, I think I'm going to be an engineer. I want to go to college. I'm not <laughs> going to be one of those women in my family that age of 18, they just finish their high school and then get married. You're like, so, I, I got a different plan. I'm going someplace different. Yes, and my parents were very supportive. My parents didn't even finish elementary school. So it was uh, very difficult for them to even relate to what I was talking because uh, first of all, nobody even has gone to a college, and now I'm talking about being a biomedical engineer. Biomedical engineer. And uh, funny story, they would be wondering that I'll be actually digging the hole on the street because that's an engineer, or somebody changing the light bulbs, you know, because those were the only two definitions they had about engineers, you know. Mm. And I said, no, I'm going to do something different. And they believed in me. Yeah. And they said, we don't understand it. We know you are going to be a trailblazer, but be whoever you want to be. Right. So uh, I got to ask then, so from Mumbai to Indiana of all places. So talk about how did, how did you get to Indiana? I think luck. <laughs> uh, I'm Indian and I said, Indiana makes sense, right? <laughs> uh, no. So my husband is also an engineer okay. and uh, uh, he got an opportunity here uh, to come to U.S. So we migra migrated here uh, in 1996 to U.S. Okay. And we both were engineers. We were just married. And he said, yeah, do you want to try something new? I said, why not, you know? And we just came here as a consultant. Okay. And within a couple of years, we came to Indiana. 
and we just said this is a very nice place to grow your family and uh, it's a very um, small community that we liked because we wanted a place where we can raise a family. Mm. And, and so now you, you step into this world of, of the, the business realm in Indiana, mm -hmm. right? So very different business world from in, in across the country as people start talking about coming here to do business in, in Indianapolis, you know? Uh, so talk about your company, your role as a president, like unpack that for me a little bit. Absolutely. So almost 26 years back when I came to U.S. also, there were not that many women in tech industry. Mm -hmm. So let's start from there. And I will end with the same statement because it's still the same situation. And that is where lots of my philanthropic and community uh, service projects align with. Uh, so when I came here, I uh, was looking for a job. I was not even finding a job. It was very difficult. So I had to go through the whole cycle of getting my green card and visa and everything. But once everything was done, um, I said, you know, I want to start business like my dad. By the way, before I even came to US, I had my own biomedical engineering business in Mumbai. Mm. Uh, I was uh, 26 year old, pregnant with my first son, and I started my own business. So business just runs in our family. So I the started- Entrepreneur gene, it's just there. Yeah, this is in our DNA, right. So I started that business uh, and it was tough, uh, particularly being a woman, brown women, uh, I have a thick accent, I am very conscious about that. So it was tough for me, uh, but uh, we were determined. And uh, as we started the business, we also decide that that one person has to work outside because uh, you know, being an entrepreneur without any external funding is tough. Right. So I did take up a job also for a few years and then I came back to the business. Uh, well, now uh, we have around uh, 50 people globally and uh, our business is focused on business strategy and digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And in very specificity, if you ask me, we help large corporations implement SAP, which is a software, uh, sure. ERP software mm -hmm. for uh, large corporations. And let me go back, because you kind of glazed over this part as, as an entrepreneur that I know that's tough, is that the building, funding, um, you know, starting from scratch, you know, the challenges of not being from the local community, you know, like a bunch of those, bunch of those challenges. Was there a point where you're just like, this is not it, you know, or were you just always going, no, we're going to figure it out? I think we were more on the lines of, okay, let's figure it out. Uh, because we knew that we had a great business model. Uh, however, uh, I think as I just mentioned, funding and uncertainty that comes with a new business was, uh, more nerve-wracking for us. Uh, for example, you know, you have to pay your uh, employees every 15 days, whereas your client pays you every 60 days. A very simple or math, right? Days, or, or 90 days. days, right? Or sometimes they, you go in some kind of a conflict, and they even say, "No, we are not going to pay you." Yeah. So those kind of things always happen. So that was a one challenge, of course, we had. And um, being a consulting uh, firm. Uh, we do not constantly have uh, projects all the time. So it is not like that every day, nine to five, we are doing some service and we get the business. Yeah. So again, there was a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So that's why we had this game plan. Uh, and of course the benefits, you know. Uh, I just had two young children, so I had to take care of them also. So we just said that, you know, we have to have a backup plan or rather we cannot have all the eggs in one basket. Sure. So a little bit of a diversification strategy, if you would think, mm -hmm. that is what we did. Well, and you, you make a great point because what the evolution of our business is, is kind of going through that, that, that actual process of going, hey, we're project based, mm -hmm. which is great. Got project here and you're trying to get the right staffing for that. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm understaffed. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I got to you know, hire people. And then you're like, okay, those projects are over. Then you're overstaffed, and so we kind of we, we've gone through that cycle. And so our, our one of our phrases for 23 is profitable reoccurring revenue. Like we're looking at the reoccurring revenue model to try to streamline that, that a little bit. So I, I feel that pain and, and know you know what that is like to kind of go through that. But then there was a point where you're going, okay, we got this thing humming. This thing is working, and now we're rolling. You decide to to go. I'm jumping all all in. So both of us are in. So talk about uh, your husband's role and your role, and what that looked like coming together. 
So we have a very good understanding of who is playing what role. So he is a very uh, technically focused person, so he designs the solutions. He is the one who is very much focused on building the products versus I am the person who is managing uh, all the people relationships, customer facing uh, interactions, uh, sales, marketing, and uh, growth of the business and the strategy. So we have very distinct roles between both of us and we have been working together for a long time and uh, I know him for 30 years so I can say it works. <laughs> and, and did you guys have to get to a point where you're like, <clears throat> hey, work is, work happens you know, during these hours, but then there's this transition to like, we're husband and wife, we're mom and dad, and it has to look different. It is, you know, absolutely. And we have times when we don't even talk about the business, you know, and more importantly, we do not interfere in each other's tracks. We both have our own swim lines. We have a respect for each other. We understand that, you know, that what's, what are your strengths and your weaknesses versus mine. And I'm a big believer of strength finder. You know, it's one of the tools that I love it because I believe we all have different strengths, but then very mindful of your weaknesses. And don't try to uh, put yourself in overdrive to fix your weaknesses because play by your strengths. And you may have some weaknesses, which we all have, but then seek out the help where you need help. Because often as a small entrepreneur, we try to do everything. Yes. And I know it myself that I cannot do everything well. So I have to depend on my team. And one of my team members is my husband, but others, I have a tremendously talented team and I trust them. And I'm very comfortable telling them that, hey, this is where I'm not good. Yeah. And I depend on you for these things. And I think that, that's the trick that, you know, I. I think I had to be very mindful. So I was a technical person. I went for my MBA in 2007 and I consciously changed my tracks because I knew my strength, that my strength is in people management, business development. And uh, I said, I'm going to focus on that. And very consciously, I let go my technical skills, but depend on people who are much better than me. Right. Oh, it's, it's a sign of a great leader that um, can empower people in their lane uh, to do what you, you know, you, that you just can't do. And um, I think that's one of the things about our agency is going, like I tell people all the time, I may build a strategy, but I don't shoot any video. I can't edit anything. I don't design anything. I don't build any websites, you know. And so to have a great team, you have to have, you know, all those components. Something you said earlier, though, that made me, made me think about this is that so there's obstacles definitely of being a black and brown business owner. And um, you know, you also mentioned your thick accent. Um, I'm just curious, you know, has that been a barrier that you've had to work through to overcome? And is, is, have you learned to navigate through that, you know, uh, that language barrier? Uh, I, think, I don't think so. I've worked too hard on that because uh, one of the things I believe is that everyone has an accent. So when in my first few years of uh, when I came to US, yes, there were people who even talked to me, talked and said, oh, you know, you, oh, I love your accent. I said, yeah, that is my identity. But then I look around and people say, oh, you have such a Southern accent. Oh, you sound like New Yorker. So I think we all have an accent. Mm. So why do I feel uncomfortable with that? Mm. But be proud of who I am. Mm. There's an, another thing, my English is never a perfect, is never perfect. But I said, you know, multilingual people can actually speak more than one language. Sure. So not everybody is going to be very good at English. Rather, half the people I meet in U.S. are not really I was good say, at English. My, my English isn't very good either, so, so I don't, I'm, not, I'm not proper enough for most people. So I can speak five languages. Wow. What are they? Uh, English, uh, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, and Punjabi. I can understand Punjabi. So I can understand four languages from India and of course English. So I think I went through, in the first few years, I was very uncomfortable uh, because I feel at many times people around me made me uncomfortable because I would walk into the room as a woman tech executive, I would be the only one who looked like me, who spoke like me. Mm -hmm. But then I had to prove myself, of course, first. It was not an easy one, just as you asked me. 
But then at the same time, I had to believe in myself. And I had to say, if I cannot stand up in front of people with confidence, they are really going to read me that I'm uncomfortable. So I had to really be, I had to collect myself, you know, all the strength. And I said, you know, I'm not going to let these forces put me down anymore because I'm very comfortable as who I am. And I think that is the one thing I'm re I really tell a lot of minority uh, business owners or young professionals, you know, that if you don't define yourself, somebody, somebody they else will do it for you, you, right? Let me ask you this, because you talk about, um, uh, you said earlier something about, you know, people look like me. And um, I, I've, I've walked into those rooms where I've been first onlys, you know, all, all your life, right? And you learn to acclimate to that. Um, but I'm curious, and this comes from a, this is a little bit of ignorance on my part, so, so bear with me as I ask this question, is do you have that, like, people don't look like me from a black and brown, from, from a, um, an a American national perspective versus, you know, like I'm looking from an Asian perspective or I'm looking for, you know, I, I'm just looking for somebody that maybe speaks like me or has a, has, has a worldview, you know, like, what, what does that look like for you? Uh, so for me, it is, again, I, I define myself as just who I am because I believe every individual has unique strengths, unique personalities, and we, we have our own gifts. So I stopped looking at myself as I'm the only woman in this room or I'm the only brown person in this room. Uh, but I just said, you know, I am going, I'm walking into this room as just RuPaul. And I know how I can prove my value. I know what is my worth and my work will speak for me. So it was an up, uphill battle. It wasn't easy. Was but there, then I had to make sure that, you know, I prove myself. Was there a click, like a time, like I had done enough or I'd been enough or I had earned enough? There was, was there a time that you're like, now I'm just, I'm Ripple and I'm confident in this room? It was uh, not that easy. As I told you, I have my own... Uh, experiences that I don't want to talk about today. But yes, I think, but some of those experiences have actually molded me in who I am today. Yeah. Like I'll get, I can tell you one, I had one of the manager very early on, and he said, you cannot be uh, promoted to the next level, like a senior manager or director level, because you look like a soccer mom. You don't fit in typical, American executive profile and he told me what is executive presence and from that day Hold on, but, but he did say you look like a soccer mom. What's soccer mom What's because it? I had two children I was I'm a very caring person and everybody in the room were very uptight because I'm talking about 15 20 years back when managers used to have a very uptight and a very aloof approach which is so different nowadays. I see everybody's talking about emotional intelligence and you know, your, what is your EQ and all kind of things. But 20 years back, that was not the trend yeah. because there were not that many women in the executive cadre. So all the guys want to be very stern and, and I'm the one who I, I'm a very warm person. I go, I want to spend time with my team. And I would say, hey, we can do this together. I was really spending time with my teams to even understand what were their personal challenges. Why are you not performing? Is there something else? So he didn't like that style because he said, that's not how, that's not called executive presence. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable doing who I am because I could see that my team loved me. Yeah. And uh, in fact, so some of those negative experiences actually helped me build that confidence that I did not have because I could literally see that what he was doing was not working. And it also helps you go, I, I don't ever want to be a leader like that. Exactly. And I want to build something, you know, so different, you know. Um, you know, I have, a, I, have, I, have some, I have a mixture of staff, old and young, you know, here. And often I'm like, some of our younger staff has no idea what it's like to work in a negative corporate environment where you just can't do the shit that we allow people to do here. Like, yeah. like they, they mentally can't even understand that that can't happen in 80% of places in, in, in America today. Um, but I'm only that way now, because I didn't used to be that way. I used to be a shitty manager too, like a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, that are, are recovering from that because I saw a bunch of things that I didn't want to really do. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the questions I had too for you is, so an executive mom, mm -hmm. 
So talk about how, how did that add to challenge pressure to try to balance it and be, you know, great mom? I think that's a question for my children. <laughs> 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 no, but I think uh, it was uh, good in a bad way because um, I knew that I only had me and my husband in this country. We didn't have any family support here. So whatever we do, we had to be one team. But then on a hindsight, I was also missing out, not having family around me. So my children could not have like their aunts and uncle come to their soccer game and you know, ha have a family around them all the time. So what we did is, you know, we spent a lot of time in the community and probably I know I'm taking away your next question. <laughs> it was exactly my next question. <laughs> so we made a very conscious investment in the community so that you know kids can get a lot of uh, learnings from this this community where we are raising them so that was the first thing and uh, uh, of course i have a very supportive husband so uh, my children were i guess six and twelve when i went to do my executive mba in northwestern university in chicago so i used to travel every other weekend drive up to chicago for two two days while doing the full-time job wow. and then we knew it that uh, we have to, uh, like he said, for two years, I'll take over. And as a consultant, I used to travel Monday to Thursday also. But then uh, I think what we did everything what we wanted to do for our children also, mm -hmm. because we wanted to do the best for them. And I wanted to be their role model. Mm -hmm. So if they see me, because I, I, I just told you my parents were my role model, mm -hmm. and we wanted to be a good role model and just show them that, you know, this is how we can serve the community and uh, study and work and uh, spend time with the family. Well, what, one of the things that, and you started to go there a little bit, and as, as an example to your kids is your community service, mm -hmm. you know, the impact you make in community and how that is important. I know you uh, involved a lot of things, um, international uh, uh, women's organization. Like, so unpack for me why, number one, and number two, then, and then what are you doing in the community? First of all, why is a, why is a two, Two point question. Number one, yes, I learned from my parents to serve the community every single day. Like we didn't have lots of resources I just mentioned, but still my parents were very giving. So that was the first value that I wanted to pass on to my children. Uh, but the secondly, when I came to this country with an engineering degree, uh, I had a lot of hurdles uh, going through my college and not able to not having enough money to even pay 120 US dollars annual engineering fees. So, yeah. And then I came here and I said, wow, I'm coming to one of the most uh, advanced country. And when I saw the uh, inequality in this state, country, it broke my heart. Mm. I could not see that. And I said, this is my calling. Today I'm sitting in front of you because I didn't have a very favorable situation to go to engineering school, but because of my education, I am here. So I want to make sure that I'm able to guide others on that path because it is so important. And I think in this country, racial equity and all the challenges that we have, it's been going on for centuries. I've just come to this country 25 years back. So I have a lot of learning, but I also owe a lot back to this country because it has given me some opportunities. Mm -hmm. And there's so many disparities. It's such, such a broken system here. Yeah, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in our next segment on this DEI effect. Let me just ask, uh, point it here. Talk about some of the charities, uh, nonprofits that you're, that you're, I know it's hard to sometimes say ones without forgetting some, but, but I'd love to get a sense of just like, where are you serving? So I serve my community in Primarily, just a few segments. So number one is diversity and inclusion. Uh, that is number one for me. Um, second is education, because I do believe that education can enable individuals for economic independence. So that is critical for me. And then number three is, you know, helping young people and women for entrepreneurship. And then when I do things, you know, probably tech and healthcare comes uh, 
most often in my conversations because I'm a tech executive, I'm a biomedical engineer, I love my life science industry because that's where I've served the most. So that are my, those are my three buckets, you know, yeah. if I would say. So I'm president of Asian American Alliance. Uh, I'm a tech editor for Indianapolis Recorder. Uh, I'm on a board of uh, Indiana Chamber of Commerce. I'm on a DAC committee, which is Dean's Advisory Committee for IU Lady School. So those are my socks. I thought I saw some IU yeah, socks. You know? I, almost, I almost kicked you out when I saw that and said, <laughs> I got, let's get some boiler socks on here. Yeah, so, uh, so most of my uh, philanthropic and community engagement initiatives are all in these categories, you know. Yeah. So being the president of Asian American Alliance, it gives me uh, depth and the breadth to touch entire community. Uh, and of course, Indianapolis Recorder is my very near and dear project uh, because that is where I'm able to move the needle. Mm. And another, my very favorite project is, you know, Black Data Processor Association. It's called BDPA. It's a national organization and I sit What's on... It called? It's called Black Data Processor Association. Mm. It's basically a um, national organization for black IT professionals. Okay. And I'm on the Indianapolis uh, uh, board just to name few. Uh, wow. But then I'm always looking for, I said, hey, you know, I have some time and uh, <laughs> can I do something? So yeah, right now I'm the program chair for International Women's Day. Which is? Which on is March 8th. <laughs> it's a free event and it will be hosted inside the India, uh, Indiana State House Auditorium. A lot of big undertakings and, and all of that. I wish we had time to unpack every single one of them, but I know you're making an impact here. I have, I'm going to have one really important question at the end here, but i got to put you on the hot seat for a couple minutes sure. and ask you some rapid fire questions. Oh all right, gosh, here I we go. You ready? ready? Okay. One word or one phrase answers. Favorite place to vacation? India. Um, uh, coolest city you've ever been to? Coolest city I have been to is Sao Paulo. I okay. really loved it. Favorite homemade meal? Favorite homemade meal? Uh, wow, well, I make very good um, um, samosas. Okay. Uh, favorite restaurant? Favorite restaurant? Oh wow, that's a lot. But I love Thai food, so I don't want to name of one restaurant. All right. Well, I like spicy food. I'm Indian. I love spicy food. A brand that you love? Brand? Wow. I'm not a very brand conscious person no. because I wear lots of clothes from India also. Like the scarf I got from India. So I always accent my dressing with some Indian or some international. Uh, then who do you think has a great brand? Mm, I would avoid that question. And you're avoiding that question. All right, I'm going to let you off. This hot seat, but I'm going to let you off on this one. Okay. Favorite sports team? Uh, I would say Colts, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a college that you love? Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. The last TV show that you binged watched? Oh, I all the time watch Saturday Night Live. I totally love it. That's a great <laughs> entertainment. It's better than watching the news channel. Uh, a movie you think everyone should just watch? Wow, I was really, really, again, I watch lots of Bollywood movies also, but I think I really love the movie, which is called Mississippi Masala. Okay. It's probably not a lot of people have watched that movie, but they're truly shows a journey of an immigrant mm. from Africa mm. and an Indian family who, who, was, who has lived there forever and how country, how people can actually, it's, it's, a, it's a story of a belonging. Mm. So an Indian family believes that they belong in Africa. Okay. Uh, a book you'd recommend? A book. I'll tell you, again, I'm not a book. I'm, I don't read lots of books, but I'll tell you, my favorite book lately has been, you know, Mrs. Obama's recent book. That was amazing. Yes. Um, your favorite type of music? Uh, I just like light classical. Okay. Uh, a hype song, like you're walking on the stage song to go, to go do your thing. Mm, from Slumdog Millionaire. Mm. Um, and then this is going to be maybe a tough one, but uh, is a nonprofit you love to support? I would say my Black Data Processor Association. Okay. Because uh, that we're, we're, there we are making a lot of impact. Um, and, and can I do too? Yes, the Asian yes, American yes. Alliance also. Yes. Um, so, last question is. Um, there's going to come a time in you know, all of our lives, your life, where you're going to have a number, there's a dash, and there's a number on your tombstone. 
and it represents your life. Uh, and there's going to be a bunch of people talking about you. What is it that you hope or want them to say about you? I touch their life in a positive way. Well, we're just now getting to know each other, um, but from everybody I've ever talked to, anytime you say your name, that's exactly one of the things that people say is that you impact so many people's lives, um, going out of their way, things that maybe not even uh, you know apply to you, but as a connector, as a relationship builder, I've, I've definitely heard that you know about you. So um, thank you for coming and visiting me today, but you have the privilege to being able to give it the wrap. It's a wrap. That's all? Yep, that's it.